In the Realms of Mediumship by Chico Francisco Candido Javier and inspired by the spirit Andre Luiz. Chapter 7 Spiritual Rescue Clementino's influence completely enveloped Raul, who stood up and spoke kindly to Laborio. My friend, let's stay calm and ask for divine help. I'm sick, desperate. Yes, none of us are well, but we mustn't lose faith. We are children of our Heavenly Father, who is always generous with His love. Are you a priest? No, I'm just a brother. That's a lie. I don't even know you. We are all one family under God. The troubled spirit laughed ironically and said, You must be some fanatical priest to talk like that. Raul Silva's patience touched us. He didn't address Laborio as if he were an inhabitant of the darkness who was capable of awakening any impulse of tactless curiosity in him. Notwithstanding the invaluable aid of the mentor who accompanied him, Raul himself expressed compassion, mixed with unequivocal fatherly interest. He welcomed the guest without amazement or anger, but as if he were a disturbed family member who had come home. Perhaps for this reason, the obsessor in his turn became less angry. As soon as the patient began to dialogue somewhat better with the center's director, we noticed that Eugenia doubled her efforts in providing assistance. I'm not a religious minister, continued Raoul calmly, but I would like you to accept me as your friend. That's a laugh. Friends don't exist in times of misery. Every friend I ever knew abandoned me. The only one left is Sarah. I'll never leave her. With his gaze showing that his thought was fixed on the person he was referring to, he added with repressed indignation. I don't know why my movements are being restrained. That's pointless. I don't even know why I'm restraining myself. Any person who has been provoked to the extent that I have ought to come to blows with all of you. Tell me, what are these silent men and women doing here? What do they want from me? They are praying for your peace, said Raoul in a kind and endearing tone of voice. So what? What do we have in common? Do I owe you anything? Quite the contrary. We are the ones who owe you our attention and assistance. This is an institution of fraternal assistance, and it is beyond a doubt that, in a hospital, no one can rightly question the private struggle of those who knock at the door, because, more than anything else, it is the obligation of medicine and nursing to treat bleeding wounds. Faced with this argument uttered with sincerity and simplicity, the obstinate suffering Laborio seemed to become even calmer. Emissions of mental energy from Raoul reached his chest area as if looking for his heart. Laborio tried to speak, but like a traveler who could no longer withstand the dryness of the desert, he was moved by the tenderness of that unexpected welcome rising before him like a fountain of cool water. Surprised, he found that the word stuck in his throat. Under Clementino's wise command, the counselor spoke with great tenderness. Laborio, my brother. Those three words were spoken with such an inflection of fraternal benevolence that the guest could not contain the tears that sprang from the depths of his soul. Raoul came closer. With a luminous, magnetic energy pouring from his hands, he laid them on Laborio and invited him. Let's pray. After a minute of silence under Clementino's inspiration, Raoul prayed lovingly. Divine Master, cast your compassionate gaze on our family united here. Travelers of many pilgrimages, at this time we rest under the blessed tree of prayer and implore your help. We are all indebted to you, and we are all in pledge to your infinite kindness, like servants indebted to their master. Although we pray for us all, we pray especially for this friend, whom you have surely sent to our hearts as if he were a sheep rejoining the fold, or a flesh and blood brother returning home. Master, grant us the joy of receiving him with open arms. Seal our lips so that we may not inquire about his origin, but open our souls to the opportunity of having him with us in peace. Lend inspiration to our words, so that imprudence may not find its way to our tongue, deepening our brother's inner wounds. Help us maintain the respect we owe him. Lord, we are certain that chance does not preside over your designs. Your love, which invariably reserves the best for us each and every day, brings us closer to one another for righteous work. Our souls are threads of life in your hands. Adjust them so that we may obtain from on high the blessing of serving with you. Our Laborio is one more brother who has come from afar, 
from remote horizons of the past. O Lord, help us, so that he may not find us proclaiming your name in vain. The visitor was weeping. We could clearly see, however, that it was not the power of the words that were affecting him, but the radiant sentiment that structured them. Raul Silva, under Clementino's radiating right hand, seemed enveloped in intense light. Dear God, what's happening to me? Laborio managed to cry out in tears. Brother Clementino signaled to one of the workers from our plane. He quickly obliged, producing an interesting item that looked like a screen of very thin gauze, with special devices, and measuring approximately one square yard. The meeting's spirit mentor turned a small key in one of the corners of the apparatus, and the soft fabric became covered with a light, whitish, shimmering fluidic mass. He then positioned himself next to Raoul, who under his control said to the communicant, Remember, my friend, remember. Appeal to your memory. Watch the pictures that unfold before your eyes. Immediately, as if his attention were compulsively drawn to the screen, our guest focused on it. We watched in amazement as the sensitized rectangle displayed various scenes in which Laborio himself was the principal protagonist. Receiving them mentally, Raoul began to describe them. Look, my friend, it's nighttime. The racket of voices can be heard in the distance. Your elderly mother is calling you to her bedside, asking for your help. She's exhausted. You're the only child she has left, her last hope in a tormented life, her sole support. The poor woman can tell that she is dying. Her difficulty in breathing is torturing her. Her heart problem is foretelling the end of her body. She's afraid. She says that she's afraid of being alone because it is Saturday during Carnival, and the neighbors have departed for the festivity. She looks like a frightened child. She gazes at you anxiously and begs you to stay. You respond that you are only going out for a few minutes, just long enough to get her medication. Then you immediately go to her drawer in an adjacent room and take the only money she has left, a few hundred cruzados, which you think will enable you to enjoy that illusory happiness at the nightclub. Spirit friends staying in your home approach you, imploring your help on behalf of the patient so close to death, but you show yourself impervious to any thought of compassion. You say a few hurried words to your sick mother and leave. Out on the street, you are joined by undesirable discarnate companions with whom you have an affinity. Disturbed spirits, hypnotized by vice, with whom you are dragged into reckless pleasure. For three days and four nights, you surrender to madness completely forgetful of all your obligations. Only at dawn on Wednesday do you return, semi-conscious and drained. The old woman, rescued by anonymous hands, no longer recognizes you. She awaits her death with resignation, while you walk to a room in the back intending to refresh yourself with the bath. You turn on the gas and sit down for a few minutes, your head spinning. Your body is demanding sleep after such crazed revelry. Irrepressible fatigue overcomes you. You lose sense of yourself and you fall asleep, half drunk, losing your life to the toxic gases. On a sunny morning, a funeral car delivers you to the morgue as a simple suicide. At this point, the patient, as if waking from a nightmare, shouted desperately, Oh, that's the truth! The truth! Where's my home? Sarah! Sarah! I want my mother! My mother! Calm down, counseled Raoul compassionately. We are never without divine assistance. Your home, my friend, closed its doors along with your eyes of flesh, and your mother is now in other spheres, extending her loving and sanctifying arms to you. Overwhelmed, the communicating spirit fell into tears. So great was his emotional crisis that the group's spirit mentor rushed to disconnect him from the mediumistic instrument, entrusting him to the spirit guards so that he could be appropriately sheltered in a nearby organization. In a profound process of transformation, Laborio departed, and Eugenia resumed her normal position. Because the screen had returned to its original transparency, I addressed our guide with some spontaneous questions. What was the function of that unfamiliar rectangle? What scenes were those that had so quickly appeared right before our very eyes? That apparatus, Aulus kindly stated, is an ectoplasm condenser. It has the ability to concentrate the energy rays projected by the meeting's participants, thereby reproducing the images that flow from the communicating spirit's thoughts. 
not only for our own observation but also for analysis by the counselor who receives them in his intuitive field, now aided by the magnetic energies from our plane. Obviously, the workings of such a mechanism must be extraordinary, said Ilario, greatly impressed. It's nothing to marvel at, really. The spirit guest only gazes at the reflections of his own mind, much like a person who examines him or herself in a mirror. But if it is actually an energy condenser, I considered, then we would have to conclude that the success of the endeavor would depend on the collaboration of all the members of the group. Precisely, confirmed the assistant. The ectoplasmic energies are supplied by the group of incarnates for the benefit of those brothers and sisters who are still semi-materialized in the vibratory fields of the physical experience. That is why Raul Silva and Clementino require the concourse of the whole group, so that the mechanism can function as harmoniously as possible. Individuals who exteriorize dishonorable sentiments, equivalent to poisonous principles arising from various types of degrading behavior, greatly interfere with activities of this nature, for they cast into the condenser the darkness they harbor, harming the effectiveness of the assembly and impeding the clear image on the screen for the spirit in need of comprehension and light. The issue invited a great number of questions, but our guide gave us a subtle look as if to ask for our silence and attention.